Hey everyone, welcome back to another highlight video for the month of August 2021. And many of you are probably coming back from uh, break, you're starting school right up again, you might be uh, have already started. And so I hope you're doing well. I hope uh, you are having a great start to your year. I know things are all over the place. And as I did last month, I wanted to share a little story with you before uh, you get to hear the highlights from this last month from our incredible guests. And it's really about this idea of when we actually make mistakes, how do we, how do we actually keep accountable to ourselves and what does that actually do um, for the people that we're connected with? And I always love to share these little basketball refing stories. I actually remember I was refing a basketball game at the, at the college level. And when we're doing this game, it's, it's what's called three person refing, right? And so the first quarter goes by, I actually don't make one call the entire quarter. I kind of feel like, hey, it looks like I'm not actually doing my job. It's kind of weird for not to make a call the entire quarter. So the second quarter comes along. And because I'm just feeling like, hey, I'm not really involved. I'm not doing something. Uh, I make a call for a foul. And it was a terrible call. It was so bad. And it was just me trying to get involved. And I knew it right away. And the coach actually started yelling. He was very upset about it. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the yelling, but he had a, he had a legitimate grievance because I had, I had done something that didn't make much sense. And so as he's, t as he's talking to me, we're still playing the game. We're still going. I said, uh, Hey sir, can you just hold on until there's a stoppage in play? And then I'll come talk to you about it. Cause he wants my attention really bad. And so he calls a timeout. He wants, he wants to talk about me, right? Talk to, talk to me about that call right away. And so uh, he calls the timeout. I go talk to the other refs and they're like, don't go over there. And they know I made a mistake. They know I screwed up. They didn't say that because they wanted to kind of back me up. Um, but they just said, don't go over there. I said, no, no, no I'm, all, I'm all good. So I actually slowly walk over to the coach. And before he says anything, I said, coach, I know you're upset about that call. And I would be too, because it was a terrible call. My bad. I'll get the next one right. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, all right. And that was the end of the conversation. And I think sometimes when we think about, you know, when we screw up, we kind of see this. But, but what was he going to say after? Yeah, you did screw up. I, I just told you that. I just told you this. And I kind of had this mentality that I would like to kind of point out my flaws before somebody else did. And I think sometimes when we actually take ownership, you know, over mistakes and we can create, you know, do, uh, you know, take accountability right away. Uh, it actually makes it a lot easier. And it actually makes the person that maybe we, um, you know, screwed up to or, you know, for, or whatever, however you want to say it, they're, they're much more understanding because if we take that ownership ourselves, uh, it seems to be a better path forward. So I think about that, not only obviously in the context of, you know, being a referee, but in leadership and education, uh, really kind of just taking ownership of that because really that is part of learning. That's part of the process. It's part of growing. It's part of, you know, getting better is that, Hey, we look at this mistake, we get better and move forward. So I just wanted to share that with you, just something to think about. Uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. There's so many great highlights, and uh, wherever you are in the world, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. Take care, and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. See, we're three part beings, right? Mind, body, and spirit. And so usually when we're having difficulties focusing, it's because biologically we have um, a lot of adrenaline that keeps our mind racing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so also there's a comparison between people that are highly organized and structured. The sounds that best suit them are like soft jazz music, um, music that has melodies that you can follow. And for people that are on the go that uh, have schedules that are more flexible, that that are not as so highly structured, sounds that don't have uh, direct rhythms mm -hmm. and um, melodies to follow can help them decrease some of that anxiety. With the sound bowls, what's happening, there's, there's seven bowls and they are correlated to the seven energy centers in the bottom uh, of the body. And so every time the bowl is strummed, um, it releases a frequency that you hear that kind of just moves around the internal body chemistry and gets those hormones that are not regulated or not uh, balanced due to trauma in mm -hmm. the body to start pumping and going. So what you'll find is that 
the longer that you're able to meditate or listen to these sound healings, naturally the the adrenaline, all of the other hormones that have built up that, that are toxic in your body will start to lower. Your blood pressure will start to lower because your body's naturally producing what it needs to produce. When we're in um, traumatic situations or, or uh, hurried situations, we're producing a lot of adrenaline mm -hmm. in our body and, and high levels of that over time pushes us through situations that sometimes we can't think through all the way. Mm -hmm. Our body responds before our brain does. And so when you're able to kind of regulate those emotions and, and calm down, you're able to make better decisions for higher emotional payoff. But it takes practice. I was the same right. way. And now when I put on the headphones and listen to um, like binaural beats, mm -hmm. which is beats that have conflicting sounds to help um, regulate the you know, the hemispheres in your brain so mm -hmm. it helps for deeper states of meditation now honestly it feels like heaven when i hear it because right. it's just um just a release have you seen those videos of people the asmr like yeah yeah. Whispering in? yeah it's it's sort of doing the same thing because we're in a society with so much energy and so much um on the go right and so when you have to calm yourself down to focus and listen. Yeah, it's releasing those hormones and helping regulate your emotions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna like start a paid podcast listening because I feel like I'm yeah. getting, I'm getting some gold right now. Because like, yeah, I actually, I mean, yeah, I love it. Seriously, and then, and I know people listening to this. So okay, so just I want to try to understand this a little bit deeper. So yeah, it's not, it's not just like this sound will work for everybody. It's actually kind of identifying some of the ways that you are and kind of identifying some of those different. Is that, is that my yeah. understand that correctly? Because that, that to yes. me, like, you know, I just, I think a lot of times it's, um, I, like, if I get a massage, it's like, mm -hmm. this music's not doing anything. It's actually making me more anxious sometimes, right? And maybe it's yeah. kind of just how yeah. I'm wired a little bit. Is that, am I reading yeah. that right? It could be, right? You got to mm -hmm. find what works for you. Mm -hmm. But then also, there's a number of things, right? When you set yourself down for meditation, um, sometimes people feel guilty. There's a number of thoughts that goes through their head, like, is this really working? Do I even have time for this? So they don't even mm -hmm. gift themselves right. the time of silence, mm -hmm. of just not move, not moving, um, relaxing your brain. And so when you get into those, those, that space of just letting what comes to you and observe your thoughts, right? Observe what's happening so that you can make better decisions. Um, it prepares you. It, it, it makes you able to regulate yourselves in difficult situations. And so that you're taking what you're practicing and you can apply it to real life, right? Life is supposed to be a walking meditation. If you think about it, you're supposed to always be aware of what's happening, what's happening to yourself mm -hmm. so that when you're encountering something, you get to choose if you want to experience it or not. We don't have to experience everything that comes right. into our face, right? But the problem is, People get so triggered by what's in front of them right. because of a biological response mm -hmm. that's inside of them. Think about, I don't know, think about a situation that happened to you that caused some sort of trauma that, you know, you'll have a trigger to, mm -hmm. right? It's stored in your body. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of that energy, all of the hormones, the built up hormone levels are stored. So when you have a similar trigger that you encounter, your body will respond faster than your brain will, unless you put yourself in different environments to get what you need naturally. So when you talk about like some of the things that you focused on, how has that like helped you in the classroom? Like what, what has that actually done? Because I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people see all the stuff that you share but like, mm -hmm. how does it actually like improve learning in your classroom? How does it help students, yeah. the ones you work with every single day? Totally. I think this is key. So I think, you know, there's been a really big push with social emotional learning in the mm -hmm. classroom. And the whole idea behind it is, can we regulate our emotions? Can we get to a place where children come out of our school system being able to be, you know, highly functioning adults, like having a good sense of their understanding of themselves and their emotions and their their uh, interactions with one another, their thinking, all of that, really being metacognitive about their their approach with each other and then their old their own self concept. The irony, however, is that many educators uh, 
have a hard time with mm -hmm. a lot of the skills in there. Not that we're not experienced. It's just to dig into that self-knowledge, to dig into who we really are, our goals, our dreams, our what makes us feel happy, all those self-care mm -hmm. practices. Those are things that, in fact, we need to be practicing ourselves and we don't always. And so I think a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last, you know, four or five years has been around how do I take care of myself, not just with meditation and, mm -hmm. and self-care, but also like craft the life that I want to be leading, set goals that are really ambitious and in tune with my values. How do I do those things in such a way that when I'm living a really wholehearted life where I feel proud of where I'm going and I feel proud of the trail that I'm leaving behind, that I that energy comes off in the classroom, that I'm able to, through example, mm -hmm. tell my students, you can be an author. You know, I right. see these kids who have limitless energy, beautiful, you know, creativity. You give them one little spark of an idea and off they go in, in so many direct, like really amazing skills. And to be able to sit there and really tell them with conviction, you know, you can actually do something with this. And you may not see it right now. Your parents may not see it right now because maybe it's a lot. Mm -hmm. But you have so much creativity in you that you can do something with this. And so I think being able to follow follow that calling or that little voice inside that says you can do something that maybe seems insurmountable or seems kind of a bit of a stretch if you yourself do mm -hmm. that, it's like growth mindset, you're able to trickle that down to the kids and then they can actually see themselves in in the light that you, you know, the light that you shine on them. And I think that's really what this is about. Um, yeah, in a nutshell. What my mom and dad did for me and sacrifice for myself, my siblings to be able to do what I'm doing today. And they instilled in me this idea that your job is to ensure that things are better for your own kids, right? right. Like whatever yeah. you, whatever we gave you. And that's what they did for me, right? Like they, I had uh, so much of an easier time than my parents did because my parents made sure of that. Right. And it wasn't, we were like, you know, rich and had all this disposable income or things like that. But I think they instilled in me a lot of things that I take into being an administrator, being an educator, the importance of relationships. Like I always compare how they ran their restaurant to how I ran my school and what I learned from that experience. And so I, I, I think the, the pride that you have when you talk about your family is, is something that resonates with me because it shows that you don't need formal education uh, to be a very intelligent person. You don't need, uh, there's a lot of things that we can learn from people that maybe didn't have the same path in education because let's be honest, they didn't have the opportunity that we did. And the reason we had that opportunity is because of our families, because of our parents. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about this. Like, what do you see um, in your work today that you think is influenced by your your parents uh, and their immigrant story? Like, what are some things that you look at that you do that you're like, yeah, this this is what my parents instilled in me. Like, what are some of those things? Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I was just, I had a conversation with my mom the other day. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I taught my mom how to FaceTime, George. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's a podcast in itself. <laughs> but, 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 what I, what, what, but what I found was that my conversations with my mom are longer when I FaceTime with her than yeah. when I call her on the phone. Yeah. But I, I was thinking to myself is my mom only had a sixth grade education you know, back in the years. Of us. My father was a fourth grade education uh, because he had to go work to support the family. And my mom's situation was different because she was a woman. And I kept thinking to myself is if my mom had the opportunity to be educated the way I was, she would have been a great leader. Mm -hmm. She's no nonsense. She tells it like it is. She's honest. She's sincere. She'll give you the shirt off her back. Mm -hmm. You know, and she works, she works very, very hard. And I, I'd like to think that I have some of those attributes mm -hmm. of my mother. And I, and I believe I exhibit those, or at least I want to exhibit those every day that I come to work. And, and she was a mill worker for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, really, really, I, I cannot remember my parents, probably like you, taking a sick day. Right. Right. With my father. He was a very soft spoken leader. He led more by example. Mm -hmm. When he did speak, 
you know, people listened and it took a lot. And I, I think I gained my, I have my father's patience and my mother's impatience. <laughs> my, my father was a very patient, patient, patient man. And it took a lot. It, it took a lot to upset him. And if you upset my father, then nine out of 10 times, you were, <laughs> you were probably in the wrong, right, <laughs> so, right. so to speak. So I, I'd like to think that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a patient. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, my parents are both good listeners. Um, so, and I think part of doing the work that we do, George, you, you got to be a good listener. It's one thing to be hearing, to, to be listening, but are you hearing people right. when, when they're talking? So, and again, I think it's mostly that work ethic and also just the fact that I think I get my father's innovation, uh, being innovative mind. He worked in the mill and he was always being recognized for being efficient and for coming up with little, 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 always tinkering and making things and creating things to make the workflow more efficient as a machine operator. And, and my mother, was, my mother is just, you know, she's just a hard, honest worker. Yeah. And she was, and the other piece that I think I get from both my parents and my mother was reminding me of this the other day, when times were tough in the, in the mill where she worked, my mother was a seamstress and she would, if her hours were cut, can I clean bathrooms? Can I sweep floors? What can I do to make sure that I'm getting my full pay every week? Because any job is not above me and I would never ask someone to do something I wouldn't do myself. And I've always felt, um, I've always felt that as a leader, that if I'm asking you to do something, it's because I would do it myself. I hear sometimes you hear this on social media, you hear this in conversations in, in staff rooms, like, well, you know, like that person probably that admin's probably not a good teacher. And I'm like, I don't think every, I don't think every admin ha had to be a good teacher. I think some administrators are actually better in that role than they were teachers. I don't think that everyone was this incredible, amazing teacher. Now, like, do you have to understand education? Yeah. Totally. But there it's, there's different skill sets there too. Right. And, and I know you're a big sports guy. Like I always, some of the, some of the best coaches were terrible players and some of the worst coaches were mm -hmm. amazing players. Like Michael Jordan, I, I mean, or like magic Johnson, right. Terrible coach, favorite player of all time, terrible coach. Uh, Michael Jordan hasn't been the greatest GM, right. Yeah. It's interesting to kind of like uh, see that uh, Doc Rivers was a very good player, very good coach. So you, you kind of see um, that it's not like, I'm not saying if you're a great teacher, you can't be a great leader. Um, but being a great teacher doesn't mean you're a great leader. And like, I don't know what you think about that. Because I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Like, I think that people maybe in administrative roles see things maybe a different way can help people a different way, but not necessarily the best teachers. I don't know what you think about that. I, you know, I, I haven't really thought about that, but I, I would have to agree with a lot of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. What it reminds me of is this is when we interview all kinds of teacher, you know, all kinds of teachers, I'm not in those interviews anymore, but I used to be in a lot of those interviews. Sometimes your best teachers were the kids who were below average students, right? right? Or they got in trouble, right? Some kids who got in trouble in high school and they finally figured it out because they might, they might've been really good leaders, but they weren't, like I mentioned, you weren't doing the right things. Maybe you were involved in the wrong crowd, but you had these leadership abilities, right? Mm -hmm. So when we hired teachers, it wasn't like we were looking for the, the, the 4.0 high school students or the 4.0 college students. We we're looking for the, some of those kids who maybe struggled and then a light switch flipped right. on. And then suddenly, because they understand what it's like, not only to be, you know, work with the high level kids, but also to work with the kids who are struggling, who are right. disengaged, mm -hmm. who don't want to be at school. So I think there's a lot of parallels there with a teacher who struggled and understands the struggle of a, uh, of a struggling teacher. So they, so they know how to work with those teachers who are underperforming. Um, so I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth to that statement.
And so what I found was with each new step, I had to, uh, one of the things I had talked about in that TEDx talk was learning to, to let go, to kind of clear my mm -hmm. plate of certain things to let new things in. And that was a piece that I'm like, all right, what am I willing to let go for this next thing to begin? So I finally said, like, I, I have to let go of my, that lead pathway that has been my true baby for the last mm -hmm. 10 years. And it's going to be okay. Like I watched somebody else. I helped my student teacher teach in it this last year. I'm going to support the next person and train them well and like support them through that journey. I wrote a whole, I haven't talked about it yet. I haven't shared it on social media, but I wrote a whole letter that I put up um, that I'm going to share soon enough uh, for the next person to my classroom before I knew uh... I hired. And I just said to the next person who is going to be in this sacred space. And it's a three page, like long thing about all the great things that they're going to be coming into and how I wish them well. And like, that is my hope is that I leave a space better than I began and that I don't ever leave a space with a hole. Like I mm -hmm. really want it to be that a space doesn't revolve around me, mm -hmm. that I help it to be a space that becomes a great space because I connect with people, I do things and I work in my own way. We can't, uh, you know, focus all our time on preparing students for something. Yeah. Right. Our role is actually to help students prepare themselves for anything. Right. Here comes the pandemic. Right. You know, and yeah. all of us had to live it and breathe it and be a part of being prepared for something that we weren't ever going to be prepared for. Yeah. And I think that's that to me is like a message not only for students, obviously, but educators, because you watch so many educators who adapted quickly, who figured things out. Uh, and I think sometimes we we can easily get into the space. I like when I first started teaching, uh, it was all about how engaging I was as a teacher, right? I, I, I tell the story often, right? Like I was so funny, just hilarious, such an easy person to listen to as a teacher. Kids could just say, they were like, I could listen to you all day. And they would do that little fake thing where they actually pretended they cared about my stories so that they could, you know, tell more so we don't have to do stuff. And just, and I always say that at that point in my career, I was a really good speaker, not necessarily a good teacher. Those are two different things, right? And I remember those same kids would go to class the next year. And they're like, oh, Mr. Cross, we like miss you so much. Like this teacher like makes us do things. And like we have to figure out stuff. And, you know, we're like, you know, having to learn. I'm like, oh, oh, like what have I done? Right? And it's like, it's, it's basically the teacher had expectations that they would figure out. And that's, that was like a really big shift for me. And I think, you know, you watch uh, people that, kind of excelled during this time were the ones who could figure out a pathway. Um, and it wasn't that they didn't lean on other people. And it's not that, you know, uh, like that whole, no, like, I don't think that you have to say like, Hey, I don't want to be an engaging teacher. And I always talk about it as like a continuum, right? It's not an either or, but it's, you know, ultimately we want kids to leave school, not needing us. Right. Cause if they need us after they're in trouble. And I, I think that's a concern, not just in education, but you know, maybe a little bit in society too, in, in some ways. When I know that when I'm well rested and I'm mm -hmm. eating well, when I step into my classroom, you know, I'm more patient, I'm more fun, right. I'm more energetic, I'm not I'm not dragging my feet, picking something up, you know, I'm just more animated in that and I'm giving more of myself to my students, which in turn is hopefully going to get them to be more plugged in to mm -hmm. what we're doing. So I think that as we talk about this a lot too, Matt, as fathers and as husbands and as family members, when I'm feeling my best, I can give my best to my family too, you know, mm -hmm. instead of trying to maybe without even realizing it, avoid the, what we consider work when we're tired is really just void opportunities to connect with my children, connect with my, my wife and mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, that this took kind of a physical health and mental health kind of spin to it, but we, and we do touch on that when we present, but confidence too is getting over those insecurities. And mm -hmm. we always talk about the best way to do that is to experience and to take healthy risks. And I think that's the best part of what we enjoy doing in our presentations is that, as you know, George, we already talked about, we're huge in self-deprecation mm -hmm. and having fun. We're not standing up there 
saying, you know, this is who you need to be us. We're saying we're, we're, we're a little bit of a hot mess and we're learning as we go. <laughs> right. But we bring people up and put them into strange situations where it's comical, funny, but in the end, they become the stars of the presentation, right. the show. People are laughing. People are cheering for them. And all of a sudden, they get that that energy like, holy smokes, I just did that in front of 300 strangers. And though that was weird and awkward, I feel mm. so empowered right now. And then we talk about that was maybe dumb what we had you do. That was silly, right? But there was actually a big point. It's when you do try new things and grow a little bit, it empowers you and energizes you to do that even more. And then you're more willing to, as you get older, take healthy risks, try new opportunities, put yourself out there, jump on things. And I think that's a more fulfilling life. Yeah, you know, like one of the one of the things, uh, and I, like I really appreciate just sitting down and chatting with you both. Is I have always encouraged. Like some people say, like, "Hey, I want to do the work that you're doing, George." I'm like, "Okay, so you gotta like blog for like years. You gotta, you know, do this. You gotta do this." And they're like, "No, I just want to get to the po- that like that point, right?" And I'm still growing. I'm still getting better. And and what I've seen some people do, and is that they're just saying like. Here's, I'm the best at this. I, you know, I rule at this, blah, blah, blah. And that to me is kind of pushes people away. And maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe it's me that it pushes away. What I appreciate about both of you too is, is that, um, the humility and like, I have gone, like, I hate when anyone refers to me as an expert. Like, Oh, George is like an expert of innovation. Like who said that? I, did, I never said that. Nobody like you might. Okay. You might think that, but where are you getting that from? Cause I, no one's ever, I, I didn't go to expert school. I don't have any of that stuff. Right. All I'm doing is sharing my learning as I go. And I think yeah. that's, I think this is a message for anybody, um, you know, that wants to do the work that you two are doing is that really, it's not about, you have to be the, the best at something or, you know, we were kind of talking about this before the podcast, like, None of us have achieved, like, none of us have, like, Olympic medals. Unless, you know, maybe you, it's a surprise medal. I don't know about. Right? No, but it's no, just like you, 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 both, you, both have just, you both have just shared your learning and people connect with that, right? And so, like, is, mm-hmm. it, is that something, you know, that you focused on? Is it, was it just, you know, second nature to you? Like, wh- how did it get to that process? Because that, to me, is, like, I, I, I don't need the perfection. I need, I need to see the process. I need to see, like, where you're at, what you're thinking is how it's changed. And when we first sat down and, and started putting an outline together, uh, the first thing Phil and I spoke about was we have to be transparent and genuine mm-hmm. with our audience about embarrassing or awkward moments that we faced when we were their age, when we were in middle school, when we were in high school. So then that's how we really try to kick things off just to build that level of relatability. Like, oh, this guy pitted out at a high school dance. This guy got stood up by a girl. This guy once told, got told that his arms were too puny right. because he ran cross country all those things, but we like to put it out there just so people get a better understanding of who we are and what we're all about. And I mean, we run our speaking company like a mom and pop shop. So like mm-hmm. when people say to us, how did you guys get started? How do we get there? How do we right. do it? And we have to remind them, you know, every t-shirt that's designed, every email that's sent, every social media post, it, it comes from either filler. Right. And that's, you know, something we take great pride in. helping involve the student in the process of learning. So when I started to explain to the students what we had to do in fourth grade, I actually, one time I did a four or five combo. And when I did four or five combo, it forced me to be more allegiant to the kids than the content because it was two full grade levels of lots of standards and curriculum. And so I just put it out there to them and said, here's what fourth graders are Mm -hmm. kind of supposed to be learning about. And here's what fifth graders are supposed to be learning about. Do you see any of these things that we can connect and learn together? Are there certain things that we need to do separate? And so basically, um, we kind of cleaned the garage together, if you will. Mm -hmm. What are we going to keep? What are we going to research more? And what are we going to let go of? Um, And that helped me as a teacher sort kind of prioritize the so much that I felt like I had to give to the kids and that was my responsibility, but I, I didn't do it alone. I activated the kids and, and when you can form the question, you can get help from any kid, even if they're a five-year-old, even if they're a two-year-old, if you mm-hmm. can form the question um, as, a, as a teacher and say, here's what I'm trying to figure out, what can we do about that? 
uh, and of course you have your teaching partners mm -hmm. and things like that to help with that as well. And you try to get some of that organized, but I, I just guess involve the learner in the lesson planning and you'd be surprised at how, how wonderful that is. It, this, so like when I hear the term backwards design, right? A lot of people use that terminology backwards design and they're really referring to uh, designing from the curriculum and, and kind of like, you know, kind of what are your objectives, things like that. But I think when you're talking about backwards design, you're like actually start with the student and move backwards from there, right? Like there's ways you can understand yeah. your student and then tie the curriculum, right? Exactly. So like you can't just say, like I would never say to Precisely. a school, ignore the curriculum because that's easy for me to say as an outsider while you all lose your job, right? Like I'm not, there's a reality of that. Yeah. Like there's expectations that you have, you know, that you sign up for and whether you like it or not, like I don't want to encourage people not to do their job. But it's really kind of understanding our students. That's why I talk about the notion of innovate inside the box and, and as something is really important. So I think the updated version of like what we model is what we get is, you know, and we got to model the change that we want to see. I think it's really important to understand that that is like, let's lead by example, but understand that people are in different spaces and they might not be ready to jump on when you're jumping on. And I'll, I'll give you an example of something that um, I'm obviously people know I'm really focused on my, my, my mental and physical health, my fitness. Uh, I'm really trying to uh, get back into better shape than I, which I kind of let go to be honest with you. And I remember um, one time I was uh, at a conference and someone said, hey, let's go running for like 10 miles. I'm like, I, hey, look, I've started running, but I can't do this. And they had been doing it. They were coaxing me. And, and ultimately, I was not at that place where I could have done what that person had, had accomplished on that day. And even though they were running and I knew I should try more, I wasn't in a shape that I could have done that. And I think that I would have, felt more demotivated uh, and maybe stepped away from it totally if I would have tried something that I knew I just wasn't ready for in that day. And it wasn't that I didn't see the value in it. I wasn't ready at that time for several factors, for things maybe going on in my life, for where my, my physical wellness was. And of course, they were living this very healthy lifestyle. And when I talk about my health, I don't ever try to share like, this is what you should do. I just say, hey, these are the things that I'm doing right now and here's how they benefited me. If you can take anything and learn from that, go for it. But I understand that everyone's in a different context. And I think we have to apply that to different things. I'm a big advocate of innovation and education. But if I don't see people doing the things that I'm doing, I don't think they're less innovative. I try to understand that they're in different spaces and I continuously model what I hope to see and I try different things. But we have to understand that people are different spaces. And yes, you can model it. But I understand there are things you do today you swore you would never do. Why didn't you start them earlier? You just weren't ready at that time. And that's okay. And we have to give that same grace uh, to others. Mm -hmm.